joining us today. I'd like to thank especially Child USA for your unwavering commitment to ending child sex abuse and elevating the voices of survivors. And to our survivors here with us today, we owe you an immeasurable debt of gratitude for bravely and publicly sharing your stories. That takes an enormous amount of courage. We're here today to address the exploitation of the bankruptcy system by youth groups, sports governing bodies, religious organizations, and others to evade accountability and avoid justice in child sex abuse cases, leaving survivors of trauma with limited recourse. As more and more states eliminate or extend civil statutes of limitations for child sex abuse, we've witnessed a disturbing trend. Organizations facing costly judgments in sex abuse cases are increasingly seeking refuge in bankruptcy court. When an organization files for bankruptcy, related civil actions are halted, leaving survivors without the opportunity to be heard in court and frequently to receive remedies. Moreover, bankruptcy court does not provide a forum for survivors to tell their stories through victim impact statements, leaving many survivors who want to come forward without an outlet to do so. And time and time again, perpetrators escape without compensating survivors for their traumatic injuries and helping them live their lives. Loopholes in our bankruptcy system have allowed these organizations to avoid the full consequences of long-standing abuse and negligence at the expense of victims. And this is not how our justice system is supposed to work. That's why I'm proud today to introduce the bipartisan Closing Bankruptcy Loopholes for Child Predators Act with Congresswoman Claudia Tenney. Our bill, will exempt child sex abuse cases from an automatic stay and expand the scope of discovery in chapter 11 filings, allowing victims to continue exploring other avenues of legal remedy in civil court. Further, organizations often let off the hook by paying pennies on the dollar to victims in bankruptcy court, and this is a problem. This legislation puts an end to that unfair practice by requiring forensic accountants to investigate the financial standing of entities filing for bankruptcy and ensure accurate reporting of assets so victims receive fair compensation. And perhaps most importantly, this legislation empowers survivors to share their stories during bankruptcy proceedings stories that have been untold and unheard for far too long. While no legislation can reverse the trauma that these individuals have experienced, this bill will bring us one step closer to a justice system where survivors have a fair chance of fighting for the remedies that they deserve and that states have been made available. It's incumbent on all of us to hold perpetrators accountable for systemic abuse and ensure survivors can seek the justice they are rightfully owed. Thank you again for being here today. And now I'll turn it over to the CEO of Child USA, Marcy Hamilton. Thank you, Representative Ross uh, and Representative Tenney, but especially Representative Ross for your extraordinary leadership for child protection not just in bankruptcy, but in so many arenas. It is inspiring. And this is a major step forward for child sex abuse victims in the United States who are part of our cultural permission to let children be endangered by trusted institutions. I've been involved in either representing the victims early on back 2006 or studying the bankruptcy system as it applies to child sex abuse abusing uh, institutions. 
The very first institution that had this idea was the Hare Krishnas. But the ones that really picked it up, of course, were the Catholic bishops. We now have roughly 30 bankruptcies that have been filed by the Catholic bishops in their diocese in order to make it easier for them when they have a number of victims uh, come forward. The, the key to understand here is that the bankruptcy system, Chapter 11, which is what they all file, Chapter 11 is intended to help an honest debtor, that's from the legislative history, an honest debtor repair their business, fix some of their debts, and move on by reorganizing and starting again. It is an aid to debtors so that their business can continue. No one ever conceived of it as the right process for dealing with hundreds, if not thousands of child sex abuse victims that are victims of an institutional system that empowered predators and undermined the children that were part of that system. Today, it has become starting as an experiment to see how it would work for those institutions in trouble. It has become a toxic environment for the survivors. What happens is the victims are sidelined, the debtor, which is the organization that is the bad actor, the debtor becomes the center of the universe. It's all about their money and preserving their future. The victims are sidelined. There's nothing in the system that permits them to speak. We do have some brave bankruptcy judges who have given them a voice just unilaterally, but the system lets the debtor be the center of the universe and it lets the victims be sidelined. And the problem with that is we get less truth to the public about how these institutions are operating. We get less justice for the survivors and we tell them to sit around and wait three, four, five years while lawyers litigate and then they get pennies on the dollar as Representative Ross said. This bill goes a long way to turn this toxic system into a humane place for the victims to be able to get justice and for the public to learn the truth about what really happens in these organizations because that's the only path to reform. So thanks again, Representative Ross, for your extraordinary leadership. And most importantly, let me turn this over to our brave survivors um, who have volunteered to speak out. Each of them has been a major player in a particular bankruptcy. Um, and uh, I think the public needs to understand so the survivors get trapped into this bankruptcy and then a committee is formed and then there's co-chairs or chairs of the committee. These extraordinary individuals on the screen right now put in hundreds, if not thousands of dollars for no pay, of uh, thousands of hours, I should say, for no pay. And the end result is that they have the survivors let down and the institution typically walks away saying, okay, we're done. So these are extraordinary people. So let me start with Katie Hallberg. She was or is the committee chair of the Franciscan Friars bankruptcy proceedings. And Katie, uh, we'd love to hear from you. Yes. <clears throat> yes, thank you very much for allowing me to be here and being a part of this. Um, this is huge. So I'm I'm very proud to represent and stand for and with survivors um, that have that are going through this and that are, will be going through this. Um, so yes, yeah, so I wanted to thank you guys, thank everybody for your unwavering. Um, so your sorry, your unwavering dedication to advocating for survivors of childhood sexual abuse. Your tireless efforts serve as a beacon of light in the darkest of times for those of us that have endured this endurable pain. Unspeakable pain, sorry. The existing bankruptcy process denies survivors the opportunity for discovery, discovery while dimin dimin diminishing us to mere creditors. It lacks empathy and understanding, perpetuating a dehumanizing and re-traumatizing experience. 
The introduction of this code reform represents a significant step forward in ensuring that survivors are not further victimized by this process, by the bankruptcy process. By introducing these amendments, you are sending a powerful message to survivors that our voices matter, that our stories matter, that our pain is valid, and our voices need to be heard. I am, um, yes, I'm very proud and honored to see that this is moving forward and will continue to walk with and next to many survivors that I've gotten the opportunity to represent. It's very, very meaningful for me. Thank you. Thank you, Katie, and thank you for your bravery. Um, we really do appreciate it. Um, Steve Moreno. So now we have the co-chair of the Creditors Committee in the Diocese of San Francisco in the midst of that bankruptcy. And Steve, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you, Marcy, and, and good morning. And um, I, I, I too am honored as Katie to represent the survivors of San Francisco, but also survivors across the country in any sort of sexual abuse, because this is this is something that has <clears throat> been sitting with people for decades. If you think about this, for many of us, we've we've dealt with the trauma as youngsters and buried those secrets so deep inside of us that we didn't know that they were there. And maybe it wasn't until we had our own kids or our parents or elders passed away where we felt comfortable releasing these secrets because it started to ooze out of us. But I, I want to thank the representatives and the bipartisan support to do so. Um, I think that is so refreshing and actually part of the healing process to have bipartisan support, to have um, something that is so near and dear to all of us. I can only tell you that after decades of, of holding secrets and the courage to finally admit to myself, much less to others and or my children, of what I went through. It has been not, it's been a, a very difficult process, but also very healing. And to go through bankruptcy, I think to the point made earlier, provides the entities that perpetrated these crimes a soft landing. And that soft landing um, is tough to take. It's almost like being traumatized again. Uh, but at least you're as an adult, you can take it and you can understand it, but it doesn't feel that much better. So I just want to thank our representatives for this, the bill, um, and from the from the places in my heart where I'm trying to heal individual trauma and generational trauma. This goes a long way to doing that. And I'm honored to be part of it. I'm honored to support it. And I appreciate all the hard work in doing this. And thank you for the time. On behalf of San Francisco Archdiocese survivors, as well as all survivors. Thank you so much, Steve. Uh, Doug Kennedy uh, is next. He is professor at Virginia Wesleyan University, but he's also served as the co-chair of the official committee representing 82,000 survivors of the Boy Scouts of America. Doug? Thanks, Marcy. Uh, I appreciate it. Um, yes, I have been the co-chair of the Boy Scouts official committee for over four years now, and this process is still ongoing is now wrapped up in Purdue Sackler, of all things. And we're waiting for the Supreme Court to deal with that before we know the fate for tens of thousands of survivors. Um, uh, I was abused, obviously, in the Boy Scouts by a camp director uh, because of our wonderful statutes of limitations. And I say that as sarcastically as possible. Uh, my abuser was allowed to have a multi-decade career as a teacher and private tutor for children. Uh, since I came forward with my abuse, I have had a handful of other survivors come forward to tell me that we shared a common abuser. So uh, this legislation is so incredibly critical uh, for, for survivors. It, it, it alters a bankruptcy process that quite frankly has been perverted for the benefit of the organizations that have harbored those who have abused us. Uh, as Marcy pointed out, it uh, really is for the benefit of the debtor when it should be for the benefit of the survivor. And as Steve pointed out, this legislation is, is just critical to our healing process. 
it, it provides a number of things, but one of the things I think that is uh, can't be understated is the importance of the victim impact statement. In the Boy Scouts bankruptcy, hundreds and hundreds of survivors, uh, unprovoked, unrequired, uh, sent the bankruptcy court basically letters. These letters were handwritten, many of them, to talk about what happened to them. This was an opportunity or an effort by survivors to let the bankruptcy judge know how important this was to them, and it was a part of their own healing process. Unfortunately, hundreds of letters have gotten uh, basically lost in a docket that now uh, is over 11,000 documents. And worse yet, their letters were almost, uh, all of them were almost completely redacted. So the results are not known, their, their writing is not known to the public. These survivors have no way of knowing if the judge ever read them. So the, the victim impact statement that this legislation provides an opportunity for is just such a critical step. Uh, it really is. You know, one of the things that I've heard from survivors over the last four years is that we are people, we are humans, we are the reason why these organizations are in bankruptcy. Uh, and in bankruptcy, we are treated as a line uh, on a spreadsheet, like a line of any other creditor. Uh, and, and we're so very, very much more than that, and we deserve to be treated better, quite frankly. So I am so proud to uh, have any sort of uh, uh, do any sort of work with Child USA, an incredible organization, and and I just want to compliment Congresswoman Ross for her bravery in standing up and giving a voice for those of us who really are voiceless and deserve more. So thank you so much. Thanks, Doug. Uh Let's uh, so our last speaker is uh, Paul Jans Dunick, and um, and we have two other uh, brave survivors that have joined us, and they also have written statements that we sent out this morning. Uh, Richard Tolner, he is the uh, treasurer of Child USA, uh, but he has also been the chair of the committee in the tumultuous Rockville Center bankruptcy. Uh, and his statement is very um, uh, poignant in the sense that they just turned down the uh, plan that was offered. Um, and then we have uh, Charlie Diestris, who's also on the um, Diocese of uh, Rockville Center Bankruptcy Committee. So we want to thank all of you for doing this. Paul, you're our last speaker. Uh, and then uh, Representative Ross will take it over for questions. Thank you, Marcy. Thank you, Representative Ross, for uh, this opportunity. Um, I'd just like to add to what's already been said so articulately that we've just gone through this process. I'm the chair of the uh, Baltimore uh, Committee against the Archdiocese here, and we just did two weeks ago had six survivors uh, speak in court. The, the court gave us the time. The archbishop was there. Um, and uh, we are doing this again May 20th, uh, probably having eight survivors. So I witnessed and was quite frankly overwhelmed um, and saw this firsthand, the power of, of coming out in public and telling the story. Uh, I mean, we all sort of understand it intellectually, but for some of these, uh, as Steve said, um, they haven't talked about it even to their family. And then they showed up in court two weeks ago to, to, to tell the world. And, and what's it has been interesting in a through line is that many of these uh, survivors were told at that time, don't tell anybody or I'm gonna kill you. Don't tell anyone or I'll kill your family. And they locked it in their heart at that time and put it away and their lives stopped at that moment. And so to see these survivors 60 years later in some cases, unlock that door again uh, is incredibly powerful and cannot be um, cannot be missed uh, as as to the power of that. So I appreciate what um, this bill is purporting to do and and I hope uh, again bipartisan way sir, sir, uh, support it and and uh, understand the power beyond the finances. Thank you. Well, to all of the survivors who are with us today and, those who you represent, um, 
please know that it's um, my honor and Congresswoman Tenney's honor to try to get you some relief from um, really the abuse of the bankruptcy process and the judicial system. And I want to thank Marcy for bringing this to our attention. Um, you know, in Congress, we don't always get to do things that will have such a profound impact on people's lives. And it's because of your courage and Marcy's advocacy um, that we're here today. So I know we have several media outlets um, that have joined us and just wanted to open this up to question and answer. Um, I think Josie who opened us up will, because I can't really see all the media outlets on my screen will help us um, put you in a queue for any questions that you have for the survivors for Marcy or for myself. Yeah, hi folks, Josie here. If um, any members of the press have any questions, if you could just use the raise hand feature and then I'll call on anyone to ask any questions. Or if you're having any issues with the raise hand feature, you can also feel free to unmute. Okay. Going once, going twice on questions. Okay. Hey, I'm, uh, can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. This is Dietrich Knout at Reuters. Um, thank you for hosting this. I have a sort of a practical question. One of the things you first things you mentioned was the automatic stay not applying. Can you talk a little bit about the the impact of that? Is that go, go all the way through to liability or does that allow primarily discovery to happen or or what's tell tell me about what what why that's important to this bill? So I'm going to let um, Marcy handle that from a practical perspective um, so that because she's been involved in so many of these cases and I'm um, walking through it. So the, the primary goal here with respect to the automatic stay is to open the door to discovery. So, you know, the way the automatic stay works is that all of a sudden, all of the activity in the trial court is shut down, the survivor's thrown into the bankruptcy system and never gets an opportunity for discovery again, which frankly deprives the judges of the facts of each of the cases and also the facts of the way the institution operated. So this will open the door to a mandated hearing in which discovery will be required. Um, and when you add that to the forensic accountant, it means that we're going to get the facts and information that we would have gotten through all of the individual cases through the bankruptcy system. Thank you. Um, Sophie, you can go ahead. Hi, um, I know that at the lower level, uh, a lot of uh, potential debtors, including many dioceses, have, uh, you know, fought or lobbied to try to stop, like, look back windows from opening. And I'm curious in, uh, and, you know, in Congress, have you been able to take a temperature check? Do you anticipate any roadblocks in getting this bill passed? Well, um, there are always roadblocks in Congress. There's a great expression. I've been a legislator for a long time. There, um, there are very few ways to get a bill passed, but many ways to kill it. Um, but I do think the fact that this is a bipartisan effort and that it's within the bankruptcy um, code really helps us um, because these this is not what the bankruptcy code was intended for. And so there, the people who would oppose this bill um, really are not good actors. And we're not seeing pushback um, from the bar, for example. So I'm very hopeful. There are also um, some other bills that are going to be introduced um, in the future that are similar, not in the bankruptcy code, but similar in terms of dealing with this issue. And they will be bipartisan. And I'm very hopeful that they will start to move through the system. The only caveat that I will give to that is that we are in a very unusual legislative session. <laughs> and so not a lot of things get done, but I, 
I got a bipartisan bill through the House Judiciary Committee just yesterday. So um, I think I might be the right Sherpa for this particular very worthy mission. And, and if I could add to that, uh, you know, my instinct from the beginning, the first time I ever heard of one of these uh, diocesan bankruptcies, I said it was a violation of due process for these victims. How could they be stopped from going to court? Mm -hmm. But in the end, bankruptcy does serve some good purposes. So this does not take the Chapter 11 away from them. It simply adjusts the process so that the public gets the truth and so that it's a fairer process right now. Um, the survivors are completely silenced, and it's a mechanism to keep hiding the truth. So um, I have no doubt there'll be opponents, just as there have been to Windows, uh, but we've gotten 30 states to pass some kind of revival of expired claims. So um, it's just, we're in, a, we're in an era for the child sex abuse victim. Thank you. Um, Dietrich, did you have another question you wanted to ask? Uh, yes, I figured out the raised hand, and I have another question. Um, you just mentioned the importance of like getting the truth out. Um, can how do you balance that with the privacy? I think what someone mentioned the Boy Scouts, all of the letters had been redacted. Presumably, that was to protect people's privacy or to not reveal things that maybe they were sending a letter to the judge, not realizing it was going to be public. What what form is there like a going to be a someone in charge of writing up a report that? Like how, how does that how does the story best get out given the conflicting interests here? Well, the legislation has a provision where um, you cannot uh, suppress the information about crimes, but always the victim's identity is protected. Uh, so you know the the legal system protects them. They can be John Doe's, Jane Doe's, um, but even more important, they can be protected from disclosure through the system. Um, so, uh, that's, uh, the legislation addresses that and it, and in my view, it reaches the right balance. Right. And, and we also balanced it, um, because it's a victim impact statement and it's not actually, um, kind of evidence that will, where you'll go back and forth. We balanced that with the confrontation clause and all the other things that would happen in a different proceeding than a bankruptcy proceeding. I have a question. Sorry, I can't. I, I'm not really sure how to raise my hand um, <laughs> on this thing. Um, the provision on forensic accountants, just so I understand, can you yeah talk a little bit about that? Like, in other words, uh, would it require the entity entity in bankruptcy, the debtor, to you know have an accountant come in and look at all of their all of their books essentially and release a report to the judge and to the creditors about, or to the victims about that, or how would that work actually? Yeah, th this isn't uncommon. There are uh, bankruptcies that uh, the judge has appointed a forensic accountant. Um, and in some of those, the bankruptcy was dismissed because it turned out they had so much property that it was insupportable to be in bankruptcy. Uh, so it would just, uh, it would require the judge to appoint someone um, and then the forensic accountant, of course, a professional, would review all of the books. And what would happen is the, the reality of the wealth of the entity would be part of the process instead of an ongoing attempt to hide as much wealth as possible, which is happening in dioceses across the country. Right. So just to follow up, in as you know, in many of these cases, um, the dioceses aren't releasing information on, you know, certain assets. So the they would be required to do that as well, not just get an accountant in to look at some parts right. of the organization, not others. Okay. Well, uh, precisely. I mean, the statute requires the judge to appoint a forensic accountant and to make a report to the judge. Um, it, we don't go farther into the weeds on that. Sure. Um, but forensic accountants by profession look at all of the books and then produce reports. So uh, we're just we're trying to get more trans transparency through the system and then through this through the cases out to the public. Right. Great. Thank you. Um, and it looks like we may be out of time. So I'm going to let Congresswoman Ross give any quick wrap up remarks. Okay. Well, again, um, 
my great appreciation to Child USA for bringing this issue to our attention, my enormous respect uh, and gratitude to the survivors for sharing their stories and being such strong advocates for yourselves and for others. And um, I'm frankly thrilled that on a Zoom call that this many uh, media outlets um, are going to help shine a light on this issue. And so Representative Tenney and I will work our strategy for trying to get this bill through the House. And um, please feel free to be back in touch with us throughout the process. Thank you so much.